a certain um, hierarchy of praman among the scriptures. So then you have the Tantra Shastra. So the Tantra Shastra are manifested from the Damaru, the drum of Lord Shiva. And they also, Tantras are arranged for those in different Gunas as well. And there are many Tantra Shastras. The problem is this, that over the years, over the centuries, very sectarian persons who are envious towards God and His devotees, they composed their own scriptures that, oh, this, this Tantra. Or they took an existing Tantra and they added their own verses like this. And so there was so much interpolation. So, when we speak about Praman, evidence for what is the Vedic knowledge, it is not just the Vedas, it is Amnaya. Amnaya means Guru Parampara Parampara Prapt. Hmm? Guru Parampara Dwara Prapt Vedavakya. Guru Parampara Dwara Prapt Vedavakya. That means the statements of Vedic scripture which have been received in Parampara. It is a chat, um, uh, it is a Guru Parampara. Because the living tradition of Guru Parampara uh, is like serves as a security and gives the context and frame of interpretation for the scripture, without which the scriptures cannot be understood and without which there's no security on which scriptures are original and which have been interpolated or which have been manufactured later. So, <coughs> this is the first thing that the knowledge of the Vedas is received from a Guru and a Guru must be connected to a Parampara. So you find every time someone is saying oh, Shiva is Supreme, Durga is Supreme, Ganesh is Supreme, whatever, Shani Dev is Supreme, what, whenever these people are saying this, you'll find they have no connection to any parampara. They, at most, they may be connected to a panta. Usually they're part of just some personality cult. And otherwise they have connection to an, perhaps an older tradition, but it's a panta, it's not actually a Vedic parampara. And so they accept as Praman scriptures which are not Pramanic. They are not scriptures actually. This is it. Now the next thing is, there may be a person who is drawing quotations from a scripture which is authentic. And this scripture is glorifying some devata as being supreme. So then, for example, sometimes Shastra will say, Pran is supreme. Pran is the supreme truth. So then persons will identify that with Vayu. Vayu is the god of air. So Vayu Dev is the predominating deity of Pran. They will think like that. So Vayu Dev is supreme lord. So, however, uh, there's a method of interpretation for understanding scripture. So those methods have been mainly um, uh, collected and, uh, and explained 
by the Purva Mimangsa school of Jaimini Rishi. You know, there are six classical philosophies, and among them, the fifth one is called Purva Mimangsa of Jaimini Rishi. The word Mimangsa means reconciliation. Because the thing is, if someone says, well, your scripture says this, and my scripture says this, but it's one of the principles of Vedanta, um, Taktu Samanvayat, means that there is no contradiction in the scripture. So it, it seems that if you read different parts of the Vedas, they're all saying different things. One is saying the path of karma, one is saying the path of jnana yoga, one is saying uh, the path of upasana, upasana kanda, worship. In in Mimangsa Shastra, there is a, a process how to uh, extract the tatparya or the ultimate purpose or intention of a Vedic statement. And because also um, Sanskrit words have mukhyavriti, the primary meaning, lakshana vritti, associated meaning, vyanjam vritti, implied meaning. So then just to quote one sentence from somewhere is not a proof. Shiva is supreme. It's not a proof that Shiva is supreme. Because the word Shiva means auspicious. And who is auspicious? Krishna. So Shiva, or actually all the names of the demigods are Krishna's names and he is very charitably distributed his own name among the devatas. So if a Vedic statement will say a, a particular person, Pran is supreme, that means the word Pran here means Krishna. So, so it's wrong to say, oh, you have read some scripture which glorifies Krishna, so you're serving him, and I have read some scripture which glorifies Durga, so I am serving her, and but they both are the same. Because that means that the scripture is uh, contradictory. Now for those who come from that position, they have no problem with that. I need time to translate. I need to translate. Вы прославляете Кришну, потому что ваше священное писание прославляет Кришну, а священное писание because they think that there's no contradiction. Because they already hold the metaphysical position that the truth is Brahman, just light. So it doesn't matter who you worship because in the end you'll give them up and just enter into the light. They're atheists, they don't actually believe in any gods. Not Shiva, not Durga, not Krishna, none of them. They use their god as a stepping stone to step on his head to jump into Brahma and disappear. So their uh, interpretation. Good evening. <laughs> so their interpretation is... Uh, for them there's no contradiction. But the scriptures themselves, they uh, explain that Brahman is only the light emanating from the body of God. So even though some statements of scripture will say, um, will describe about how to attain mukti, then if you you have to rec those statements which seem to be contradictory, you have to be able to reconcile them. Shivas. 
So it's not good enough to say you follow this, so that's okay, and I follow this, so that's okay. No, you reconcile both. How do you reconcile both of the statements? And then you have a conclusion. So the conclusion is called Siddhanta. So, uh, the, what, so what we're discussing is interpretation, mimamsa, reconciliation of Vedas. So it has it has a five stage process. That is called Vishai, Sankshai, Purvapaksha, Siddhanta, and uh, Sangati. 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 So the first thing is Vishai, the statement or a subject. Someone says, Pran, it's written somewhere in there, Pran is supreme. And then, so that is called Vishai, the subject. But then the question comes Sankshai, doubt. Sankshai means a doubt. Say, but uh, uh, Pran is moving in this body. So Pran is material. Pran is not transcendental. Pran is actually Rajasic. So how can something which is Rajasic be supreme? So with any any discussion, first you ask the person, okay, what's your vision, what's your proposal? And then you raise a doubt. Mm -hmm. And then the next stage is called Purva Paksha. Purva Paksha means the antithetical argument. In other words, you you uh, compose uh, an entire argument against your first original statement based on scripture. Pran mm -hmm. cannot be supreme because Pran is the. Uh, coming from Sutra Tattva, and Sutra is a contamination of the Mahatattva, so it's Rajasik, and you can give some evidence from here and there. So that's your Purva Paksha, your opposite argument. So you have statement, doubt, the argument against, then you have Siddhanta. So the Siddhanta is, oh, in the scripture where it says Pran is supreme, here Pran means life, and the life of all living entities, all life has come from God. Aham bija prajapita, pradapita. Krishna said, I give, I am the seed giving father of all living entities. I give life to everyone. Hmm? So the word pran is used in, um, in a metaphorical sense, not in the direct sense. So that's the Siddhanta. Hmm? And then, so then, Sangati. Sangati means uh, reconciliation. That means that your original statement, your Vishai is true. But your Purva Paksha, that your antithetical argument against it, is also based on the Vedas. So these statements must also be true. Mm -hmm. So you haven't completely established your Siddhanta until you have shown how these statements which appear to be contradictory are not contradictory at all. Hmm? And, and then your Siddhanta is established. So Vishai, subject or statement, Sankshai, the doubt in the statement, Purva Paksha, the antithetical argument based on statements which appear to be contradictory to the original statement, then Siddhanta, what is the conclusion? But that conclusion is not fully established until Sangati. You have shown that actually all the statements were correct. But it was the you have to interpret them in such a way that they're consistent with each other because Tattu Samanwayat, there is no contradiction in Vedic scripture. So, this is, so when persons come it's uh, actually Krishna has said in Bhagavad Gita that Kama is Taista Ritagyana Prapadyantanya Devata. Those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires surrender to other demigods. If a person has no worldly desire, they'll be a Vaishnava and they'll serve Bhagavan. 
only those who have other desires, they become bewildered and they end up worshipping other devotees as supreme. So we respect devotees, but they should not be worshipped as supreme. They're only the vibhutis, the manifestations of the opulences of Krishna. Mm -hmm. So that's the fact. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't uh, uh, become uh, discouraged or be uh, nervous if someone says, well, the scripture says this, this, this. Then you ask her, that's a very good suggestion. Do you really want to discuss this hmm? subject matter of Mimangsa, scriptural interpretation? So in scriptural interpretation, uh, the Mimangsakas gave one formula. Upakram upasangharav abhyasa purvata palam artavadu papatischa lingam tatpariya nirnayaha the meaning is this, that when a scripture is written, then the author of the scripture, he places within his writing six uh, signs, which if taken together, point to the ultimate purpose of that text. So they're called ling. Ling means a sign or a symbol. And tatparya means the intention of the author. So if you want to know about the intention of the author, then you have to go through his writing, identify the six lingas, and then when you put them together, it will indicate what the ultimate purpose is of the author. Mm -hmm. So, the first is Upakram Upasanghara. Upakram Upasangha. That means the opening statement and the closing statement. So, for example, in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, it says, Satyam Param Bhimahi. We, plural persons, meditate on the one singular supreme truth. So it already means that we are eternal beings, and we are plural, and the truth is one, and it's not us. And that He is to be meditated upon. So meditate, when you absorb your mind in something, it's because you, you love it. Because it's great, because it's worshipful for you. So the conclusion that absorbing the mind in God in devotion uh, is given in the first verse of Bhagavatam. And in the last verse of Bhagavatam, there it says, Nama Sankirtanam Yasya Savapava Pranashana. Uh, it gl glorifies the chanting of the holy names. Sankirtan. All together we sing the holy names. So that means uh, that the first statement and the last statement, there should be something common. And the commonality is that we are all individuals and we should meditate upon God. And the actual process of meditation is given also, Harinam Sankirtan, chanting the Holy Name. So here we find in the Upakram Upasanga, opening and closing statements of Srimad Bhagavatam, there's one link. We have a link. We have one set. So then, Upakram Upasangara, um, Abhyas. Abhyas means what is being repeated in the scripture. What's repeated? Uh -huh. So, let's say if you go through Bhagavad Gita, Krishna may speak about Brahma Nirvana, liberation. He may speak about Gyan. He may speak, he may say, one should sit and uh, stare at the tip of your nose. <laughs> he says so many statements. Mm -hmm. yeah? But he doesn't say them again and again. You don't find in every chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, stare at the tip of your nose. <laughs> That's only in chapter 6 uh, on Ashtanga Yoga. But what's repeated again and again? Hmm? Mom, mom. Hmm? Krishna said, Manmana bhava madhyato madhyaji mam namaskuru. Mami vaisati satyante pratijani priyosine. Surrender to me, think of me, serve me, make your offering to me. Patam pushtam palamtayam yome bhakta prayati. Yome bhakta prayati. Offer your fruit, your flower, your water to me. Everywhere he says, me. Give to me. Sarvadamam pratyaja mame kam shanam braja. Ab, this is called abhya. Something is repeated again and again throughout the scripture. Okay, so we found that in Bhagavad Gita, Ma, Krishna saying me, 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 everywhere. This is abhyas. Repetition. So, abhyas. Uh, mm, 
Apurvata. Apurvata means something the scripture will say which is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Something astonishing. Some unprecedented claim. So, for example, in Gita, Sri Krishna said, Mata Pratanam Nanyat Kintidasti Dananjaya. There's no reality beyond me. I am. It's an unprecedented claim. Huh? In Gita Krishna, Brahmano hi patistaham amritasya bayasacha shashutasya tadamasya sukasai kanti chastacha. I am the basis of the light of Brahman. I am the foundation of immortal nectar, of eternal happiness. So he's making some exclusive claims here about himself. So this is, a, and then palam. Palam means the, what does the scripture say is the fruit of following the scripture? So Krishna speaks. Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma Nasochati Nakanshati Samaksave Shubhut Mad Bhaktim Labate Param. After you've become free from the bodily conception of life, after you're free from all lamentation and hankering, after you see all living entities equally, because a pandit sees everyone equally, then after that, then you get bhakti. <laughs> you get bhakti after that. Hmm? So, in Bhagavad Gita, See, Krishna says, <laughs> Mami vaisa si satyam te partityani priyosime. If you surrender to me, you, you'll come to me. <laughs> and those who know everything, Buddha bhava samanvita. Those who understand the essence of scripture, surrender to Krishna and Buddha bhava, they're in bhav, they're in ecstasy of love. So what's the fruit of following Gita? Krishna said, the fruit of following this is that you come to me, that you serve me eternally and you're absorbed in love. So, abhyas apurvata phalam, then, so the fal, that is the next ling or symptom, sign to look for. Then the next one is, is artapati. Artapati means appropriateness. Sorry, no, the next one is artavad. Artavad means what has been glorified. What has been glorified. So, in, for example, in Bhagavad Gita, the devotees are glorified. Krishna mm. said, Klesha dikataras tesham avyakta asakta chetasam. Those persons whose mind is attached to the impersonal conception of the truth, they are Klesha adhikar, qualified to just undergo so much suffering. But Mahatmanastu Mampata Daivim Prakriti Mashrita. But the great souls, they're under the shelter of the divine potency. Satatam kirtayanto mam yatantas chadidavak. They're always doing kirtan. So what's glorified in, in the Gita is the devotees are glorified. Krishna said, Yoga Ksayma Vahamiham, for those who are devoted to me, I'm serving them, whatever they need, I bring it myself. So the devotional service is glorified throughout. Bhaktya mama bijanati ya vanyas tasmi tattvataha tato tat mam tattvato gyatva vishate tarananthram I can only be known by bhakti. I cannot be known by karma, jnana, or yoga. Any, only by bhakti yoga. Okay. So again and again, bhakti has been, so that is called artavad, what has been glorified. And then upapati, Upapati, mm, not up, upapati, does not mean like the gopis have upapati bhav, they think Krishna is their beloved, not their husband. Uh, it's not upapati, it's upapati, there are two t's, not one, Pati, upapati. <coughs> so that means appropriateness, appropriateness. Appropriateness means that when you take all the, you collect all the link, all the symptoms, the keys, which have been given through the Shastra, you put them all together and now you should come to a conclusion by which uh, all these things, they're, they're, it's an appropriate conclusion relative to all the other links. For example, someone may say, in the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that even the, 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 everything in the universe, every planet in the universe is destroyed and then created and destroyed and created again and again. And that those who are, whose 
intelligence has been stolen by material desires worship demigods. It has been said that if a person goes to heaven, when their good karma w is finished, then they come fall down to earth again. And it has been said that whatever um, duties you do in this world, you should do without attachment to the karmic result. And therefore, the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita is, you should worship Indra and go to heaven. <laughs> no, no, no. You can't say that. Why? Because the six, the six ling must be upapati. You have to collect all the other statements, and then the conclusion should be appropriate to the other statements. Hmm? Bhagavad Gita said that hmm, Krishna is the supreme truth. He is only known by Bhakti. The light of Brahman is only his uh, partial effulgence. And those who are attached to the impersonal light, they only suffer. And therefore the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita is, we should follow the path of Jnana and try to get Mukti. Huh? Is it possible? <laughs> so, because there's no art, uh, Artapati there. Up, uh, yes, sorry, Upapati. Upapati. <laughs> so, in this way, it's not good enough for a person to just quote a scripture. The scripture might not even be a scripture that they're quoting from. And even if it's a scripture that they're quoting from, then you'll have to go through the five stages to establish a siddhanta. Vishai, Sangshai, um, Purvapaksha, Siddhanta and Sangati. And the individual statements uh, of the uh, scripture, sorry, uh, when we analyze the entirety of a scripture, then we'll have to look for the lingas in that scripture, six types, six lingas. Hmm. That is Upakram Upasangha, number one. Then Abhyas, Apuravata, Fal, Artavad, and Kupapati. So this is the uh, just a summary of the method of Mimangsa or Vedic interpretation. Now Sangati also, we mentioned Sangati, reconciliation. There are um, there are uh, three types that is called Pada Sangati Adhyay Sangati and Shastra Sangati if you take a verse like the first verse of Srimad Bhagavan Janma Jasya Yatan Vaya Dittara Chascha Te Shubhiga Surat Tane Pramma Ridyagi Kave Mo Yanti Yatsurya Tejovari Medam Yata Vinamayo Yata Tisa Gomrasa Damna Swena Sada Nirastuku Kam Satyam Param Dimahi A person may take one line of that verse and say it means this hmm? Tisa Gomrasa The The world which consists of the three gunas is the mrsha completely false it does not exist huh? this can be the meaning three sargo mrsha but according to the sanskrit grammar the word mrsha can actually be amrsha that the world is not an illusion huh? the world is real but the way you see it is an illusion. So you cannot tell from the Sanskrit whether the word is Mirsha or Amrisha. So then, you, what you have to do is, well, what does the rest of the verse say? So the first part of the verse says, Janma Dyasya Yataha, that the universe has come from God. So if God is true, then that which comes from him must be true. Hmm? Because a falsehood cannot come from the truth. Only the truth can come from the truth. Like that. So what you've done there is called Pada Sangati. That means you've reconciled uh, in the context of the whole verse. 
You were discussing what's the meaning of this word? And now you do the Sangati, the reconciliation in, the, uh, in relation to the whole verse. Okay, then let's take another thing. Say chapter 6 of Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. So then in chapter 6 there will be some description of, uh, of Astanga Yoga. So one should sit and do pranayama and look at the tip of your nose. So then someone may say, so this is the main, most important thing we should do. But then the, in the end of the, of the chapter, Krishna will say, Yogi nam apisave sham madgate nantaratana sadavam bhajate yomam same yuktat mataha. Of all different types of yogis, the best yogi is that person who with shraddha, with, with faith, is rendering service to me in his heart. This is my opinion. So now what we've done is, we could not, not in relation just to one verse, but in relation to what is the meaning of the whole chapter. So that is called Adhyay Sangati. Reconciling the meaning of a statement in the, in the context of the whole chapter, Adhyay Sangati. So, then there may be a chapter which is glorifying karma yoga. For example, in chapter in, in uh, chapter two, Krishna will say, "Kama ni eva dikara ste ma pale sukadatena ma kama phala he tu bon ma te sangos tu kama ni." Hey Arjun, you have the the qualification to perform karma. But you should do it without attachment to the results. And don't think that you are the cause of the result also. And don't be attached to avoiding your duty also. And don't try to enjoy the fruit of your work. So someone can quote many verses from a whole chapter which is glorifying Karma Yoga. But then we'll see in chapter 18, which is a summary of the whole Gita. Then Krishna says, Sarva Dharmam Pritajama may come say, give up all these karmas, all these dharmas, worldly dharmas, and just surrender to me. Hmm? This is and Krishna said that Sarva Guya to Mambuya. Now I am going to tell you the greatest secret. Now listen to me, my highest instruction. Meaning that in Gita he is given instructions, confidential knowledge, more confidential, and now he's telling the most confidential. So then that is called Shastra Sangati. Uh, to reconcile a statement in relation to its context within the entire scripture. Because these uh, six lim uh, lingas you can apply even to one verse. Mm. Uh, Jiva Goswami does that. Valdevi Dibhushan does that. He, he can, they take sometimes just one verse of Bhagavatam or the Upanishads or just two verses. It can be just a section or it can be a, a whole chapter or it can be the whole book and you can apply the links to that and do Sangati according to the, the width, the, the breadth of your, your context. context. So this is the thing, that our devotional conclusions, they are Sarva mm, Deshya. Uh, misconceptions and wrong conclusions are based on statements which are Eka Deshya. That means it's a statement in one place in the scripture. Uh, but it only, that statement only has adhikar over its environment. It's immediate subject matter. But it doesn't have adhikar over the whole scripture. Just like, for example, in Srimad Bhagavatam, then Pururava, the king, 
He's, a woman is like a sly fox. Her heart is sharper than a razor blade. She can kill you at any moment for material gain. It's very heavy criticism of women. So? Is it true or not? It was a Puroravas realization. At that time. This is not words spoken by Shukadev Goswami. I mean, this is not Vyas. Of course, he's speaking it because he's he's telling the story. But these are the words of the Purarva when he just got uh, ripped off by um, Urvasi. You know, when Apsara came and he became very attached to her and then she dumped him and went back to heaven. And he's lamenting. Like this. So it's true to the it's true to the extent that a materialistic non-devotee female can be very cruel like this. So in, in, to that extent, it's true. But it cannot be said in regard to a, a devotee. A woman is devotee. Then how can you say? Because devotee is not should not be conceived of in terms of the physical body, whether male or female or any particular caste or nationality or anything, Devo who has devotion is transcendent. So, in this way, we always have to look at the uh, context, who is speaking. Now, oh, so, this was uh, in regard to your question? And you know how to answer now. Right? One, one thing is this, that very often people don't have patience. They want to quickly come to a conclusion right now. It's like, it, it's, but it's quite ridiculous. If someone will go to a physicist and say, how can you prove the theory of relativity? Just in one sentence. You can do, you'll have to go to college for many years and study mathematics and the non-Euclidean geometry and all kinds of things. And then after a long time you may understand the very long mathematical proof. Like that. But because people they are often in Kali Yuga, Mandasu Manda Mattayo Manda Badu Taha. They have very lazy mind. Mm. So they want to inappropriately come to a conclusion at once. So it's a, uh, then you cannot make any progress. So if a person wants to know, there's a, there are methods of scriptural interpretation. And these are, do you know them? <laughs> and, of course, yeah. they never. and if they know, they wouldn't come to such a uh, wrong conclusion. So let me see what.